Welcome to the ProfServe Traction Podcast, dedicated to exploring how professional services and technology businesses break through the ceiling. Here's your host, Steve Prada. So, good day, dear listeners. Uh, this is Steve Prada with the ProfServe Traction Podcast, and I have today with me Garrett Sutton, who is the CEO of Corporate Direct and the Sutton Law Center that provides affordable asset protection and corporate formation and maintenance services uh, through four offices across Nevada and Wyoming. Um, uh, Garrett, uh, since 1988, has served over 12,000 clients, and he also has served over 900,000 readers of 11 best-selling books, of of which three was co-authored with Robert Kiyosaki uh, in the Rich Dad uh, series. He is also um, a Lifetime Achievement member of the top 100 attorneys. So that's pretty impressive. And he serves on the boards of the American Baseball Foundation and the Nevada Museum of Art. So welcome to the show, Garrett. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be with you today. No, that's awesome to have you. So, um, so Garrett, tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit about your journey. How do you become an entrepreneur and how did you build your business? Well, I, I went to the University of California at Berkeley, got my BS in uh, business administration, and then went across the Bay to San Francisco to Hastings Law School. And I practiced law in uh, San Francisco and Washington, D.C., and just wanted to, you know, live in the mountains. So I moved to Reno and I spent a lot of time skiing at Lake Tahoe. And, you know, Nevada is a great place to set up corporations and LLCs. So that was one of the reasons I located here. Um, I've always had an, kind of an entrepreneurial streak. And, you know, you can be a regular lawyer. There are all kinds of ways you can practice law. But, you know, I prefer to uh, deal with many clients and assist them in setting up these corporations and LLCs. And then, in most importantly, maintaining them so mm -hmm. they can have continued protection. So that's kind of the entrepreneurial journey is, is getting into law and then figuring out which part of the law I could be more entrepreneurial within. That's, uh, that's what's fascinating. And, and uh, you know, you, you see very few attorneys who really have this entrepreneurial streak. Often attorneys more see themselves as the expert professionals and they want to personally deliver uh, the value and you are doing it through people. So. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you do that, what kind of systems you have, and, and you know, how, how, do you, uh, how do you turn your, your practice, personal practice into a business, a thriving business? Well, Steve, the key for me is having good staff. I mean, you, you know, we, we have a staff that's very well trained, uh, that you know, knows the ins and outs of corporate formation and maintenance. And you know, it takes a while to train these people. And so I just, you know, I value the staff more than anything, more than my expertise, the logo, whatever. Um, so, you know, we, we have a team here that works together. Everybody gets monthly bonuses. And so I, I, you know, try and build a team effort here where everybody's on the same page, working for the best interest of the client. That's, that's pretty amazing. So, uh, so tell me a little bit about this whole concept of asset protection. I mean, uh, you know, I have been interested in this area for a few years now, and I'm coming out with a book, and I, I wrote like a short chapter, or well, maybe it's not even a chapter, just a few pages. And but to me, uh, what I understood it to be is essentially save on taxes and protect yourself against litigation. Is this what it is about, or are there other things? Well, for, on my side, the, the legal side is about protecting yourself from litigation, using corporations and LLCs, the limited liability uh, uh, charters that they offer to protect yourself from litigation. Now, as, on, as an entrepreneur, you're going to have a team of people. You're going to have a lawyer and you're going to have a CPA and a good CPA can save you a lot of money. You know, I tell people, you know, if you're going to spend $5,000 with a CPA, Hopefully they're saving you 15,000 or more a year. So you really want a good CPA on your team as well. In terms of taxation, the LLC is now the most popular entity choice. And an LLC can be taxed however you want. It can be taxed as an S-corp, a C-corp, a partnership. 
So you have a lot of flexibility with the LLC. You have great asset protection and you can choose to have it taxed however you want. So they do work together, Steve. We want the asset protection and we want the best taxation. So how would you compare what's available in Nevada and Wyoming and maybe other states in the U.S., Delaware, perhaps, to uh, kind of other uh, tax uh, efficient structures in other countries and, you know, exotic islands and other places? Well, in the United States, I mean, if you're doing business in the United States, you're going to have to be registered in, in the state that you're doing business in. So, you know, coming here with a foreign corporation doesn't really work. I mean, that's better when you have assets located offshore. And I don't do the offshore asset protection. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki early on said, we're not doing that. So <laughs> I only do the U.S. asset protection. And it's interesting, Steve, you know, in most countries, the, the corporate formation is handled by the national government. But here in the United States, during the American Revolution, the states were very cautious about these corporations. And each state at the, the Constitutional Convention, each state said, no, 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 we're not going to have a national corporate law. We're going to do it state by state, which is great for us because you have states that compete against each other to be the best. And the, the top three are, as you mentioned, Steve, Delaware, Wyoming and Nevada. They compete against each other to offer the best asset protection, the best protections that corporate law can provide. And, uh, you know, when we give people the choice, a lot of people like Wyoming because they're, they're equal to Nevada and Delaware in terms of asset protection. They don't list your name on the state website, so you have some privacy. And the annual fee is only $52 a year. So in Nevada and uh, Delaware, it's $350 a year or more. Wyoming is very affordable when it comes to the uh, annual fees. That's, that's amazing. I think Virginia is also fairly affordable. I think it's also $50, but I don't know how protective uh, Virginia is of uh, corporation owners. I definitely have my name listed there. So, uh, so Garrett, uh, tell, tell me about what it looks like and how is it different to have a corporation in those three states as opposed to, you know, California and Virginia? How, how is it better? Well, the state law of, for example, Wyoming, uh, the, the charging order is, is the key asset protection feature. And Wyoming is constantly updating their laws to make it the most protective. As we said, they compete with other states. California, by contrast, has a very weak asset protection law whereby if you sue someone, you get in a car wreck and you want to go after someone's LLC to collect, California law says have at it. You can go right through the LLC and force a sale of all the assets. Wyoming and the other good states say, no, you can't go in and barge in and force a sale of the assets. You have to wait for distributions to be made and you may not make distributions. So that is a very good uh, type of law that you want uh, on your side. So for example, if you get in a car wreck, you know, it's good to have insurance, right? You want the car insurance. I always recommend that people get an umbrella policy, a personal umbrella policy of insurance, which, you know, for a million dollars of extra coverage, it's only $400 a year. And so the attorneys can get at the insurance money you know, that's what they collect on. And they're not, it, it's tough to get through these LLCs. So if you have enough insurance money and then the good asset protection on all of your assets, your real estate, your brokerage accounts, certainly your businesses, if you have gold and silver, we want to use LLCs to hold those assets. So in the car wreck, which is your greatest risk, the car wreck, there's plenty of insurance to cover that and the LLCs make it difficult for the attorneys to want to go after anything else. So that's how we like to put it together, Steve. That's very, uh, that sounds uh, very logical and very smart. So, so what's the flip side? So why would then everyone incorporate all their companies in Wyoming uh, and ignore all the other states? What, what's the uh, flip side of being in Wyoming? Well, it, let me clarify one thing. So let's say we have a real estate investor. And they have a property in Virginia and a property in Maryland. We would have a Virginia LLC on title to the Virginia property, 
a Maryland LLC on title to the Maryland property because you're collecting rents, you're doing business in those states. The two LLCs would be owned by the one Wyoming LLC. So that's how we uh, configure everything. If a tenant sues over the Virginia property, that's a Virginia court case, right? You're gonna be subject to Virginia law. And that's called the inside attack where the tenant sues the LLC that's on title to the property. And that's true in all 50 states. The outside attack with the car wreck the outside attack is where the tenant has to sue to get at Virginia and Maryland, but they have to sue through Wyoming because that's what you own. And Wyoming makes it very difficult. So that's how we like to structure it. We're always going to have the entity located in the state where the property is. And then that entity will be owned by a Wyoming LLC. I know it's kind of complicated, but it's in my book over here, Loopholes of Real Estate, so <laughs> all described in that book. No, that's, that's cool. And I thought that this one was very highly rated. I saw five stars next to the loopholes uh, of real estate. So that's definitely something to read uh, for uh, if you're a real estate person. Um, so, uh, so that's the outside. Like, so if someone wants to just sue me because maybe I don't pay rent or whatever happens in Virginia, then they could sue my Virginia company and then yeah, Virginia company. They, the, the tenant is renting from the Virginia LLC. Their claim is against the Virginia LLC, yeah. not against you, Steve, yeah. right? Not against you personally, because you don't hold title in your individual. Sure. It's in the LLC name, but their claim is against the Virginia LLC. That doesn't give them a right to get into the Maryland LLC or the Wyoming LLC. So, you know, you're going to have insurance on the Virginia LLC. That's your first line of defense. Mm -hmm. um, and then the entity is the second line of defense. So it's basically all it does is it protects me, my personal property from anything that happens to the Virginia property. It's not going to reverberate over to my other holdings. That's they don't the have a chance to get at the equity in your house. They can't get at your brokerage account. They're limited to what's inside that Virginia LLC, which means we're not going to put 10 properties inside that one Virginia LLC because mm -hmm. a tenant suing over the one Virginia LLC could get the equity in all nine properties. So we don't want yeah. to create a target rich LLC. We don't yeah. want to put 10 properties into one LLC. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Uh, are there other major asset protection strategies other than this, this structure that you explained? Well, uh, certainly debt is a form of asset protection. I mean, if you get sued on the Virginia property and, you know, it's a million dollar property and you have a $900,000 mortgage, the tenant can only get the equity in the hundred thousand. The bank has first dibs on the 900,000. Mm -hmm. So debt is a form of asset protection. We also have a strategy called equity stripping where you, know, you have a, a line of credit offered to the Virginia LLC in exchange, the Virginia LLC gives the equity stripping company uh, a second deed of trust. So someone looking at the property sees that it's fully encumbered. It's not really worth going after the property. And again, that equity stripping is covered in, in loopholes of real estate. Uh -huh. So, is it similar to kind of a mezzanine structure where you have a second layer of um, preferred equity kind of instrument? It, it, it's similar, but not exactly. Mm -hmm. um, it would just be a second deed of trust or a first deed of trust. Say the properties, uh, you hold it free and clear. Uh, you can do the equity stripping, whereby you have a lien uh, against the first uh, a line of credit to the uh, property holding LLC in exchange for a first deed of trust. It's a promise to loan money in the future. Um, and so some people will use that strategy to protect the equity in these properties. Again, you're always going to have insurance on these properties. Mm -hmm. Now, Steve, there's one little wrinkle on the insurance. When you buy the property in your individual name, you'll have the premium in your name, and then you're going to transfer title into the LLC. So you use a grantee to transfer the title into the name of the LLC. So you have that asset protection. You've got to tell the insurance company that you've transferred title into the LLC. There've been cases where the insurance company says, well, geez, 
we thought the insurance was in Steve's name. It's in an LLC. Title's in the name of an LLC. We don't. We didn't insure the LLC. We don't have wow. the property. So the insurance company is say, well, gee, Steve, the LLC is a business entity. We have to charge you a higher premium, right? Mm-hmm. Which is nonsense. The risk of a fire is the same, whether it's in your name or the LLC name. Mm-hmm. But here's how to skin the cat. You say, okay, leave the premium in my individual name, but list my LLC as an additional insured. Mm-hmm. And so that way you have the insurance. You don't want to have an insurance policy in your name and title in the name of the LLC. Uh, because again, the insurance companies will use that as an excuse to deny a claim. That's fascinating. So that's when things get more complicated. Uh, people will, it's gonna be hard for them to keep all of that in their head and not make a mistake. That's when they go to you to make sure everything is covered. Um, I come from, um, you know, my, my previous business was all about arranging leverage buyouts, management buyouts. And we, you know, for a while it worked well, and then there were different rules that kind of prevented companies to, to overborrow, thin capitalization rules that you had to have certain equity and so on. What is this landscape look, uh, what does this landscape look like now in, in the US? And are you involved in these kind of transactions? I don't get involved in those types of transactions. Um, you know, certainly uh, we had issues with banks that would, Uh, lend with 2% down. Um, And then in 2008, when everything collapsed and, you know, they only had, here they are with 98% uh, loan to value and and the value is down 50%. I mean, that was a terrible thing. Uh, So the, you know, the bank lending standards have improved. Um, I think there's still some lenders that don't require enough of a down payment. Um, so that, but that's their problem. Um, <laughs> you know, in, in my experience, the, you're going to want to make the numbers work. Um, typically you're going to put 20% down, um, or you're going to have some sort of carry back. Each transaction is a little different, but I, I will say, Steve, that I haven't seen the, the crazy lending standards that we saw in 2006 and seven, those mm-hmm. have not returned. Mm-hmm. Okay. So going talking about the ownership of these companies, um, LLCs have members, and then you have different corporation, corporate structures have shareholders. What's the real difference between a member and a shareholder? It still owns stock in the organization, right? How, yeah, how is it uh, different? Th- both those words describe owners. A member is an owner of an LLC. A shareholder is an owner of a corporation. So it's just, uh, they mean the same thing, they're owners. So there's no difference uh, between them. It's just a reflection. It's just, the, it's just reflecting the type of, the type of organization. Right. And what about, uh, one thing I, I really struck me, I was reading on your website about the certificated security and uncertificated security. What does that mean and how is that relevant? <clears throat> Well, uh, uncertificated security means just a statement in the operating agreement that you own X percentage, right? There's no certificate. Mm -hmm. The certificate security means that there is an actual share certificate or membership certificate that says Steve owns, you know, 20% of this LLC. It's It's a physical certificate. And what we do is we take delivery of that certificate in Wyoming for your Wyoming holding company. And if you, if someone's suing to reach that interest, they have to get the certificate, which means they have to go to Wyoming, hire an attorney to get the certificate out of our safe deposit box. It's just another roadblock Mm -hmm. that we put up. Uh, for attorneys. And this really is important in California because California attorneys would say, Steve, your Wyoming LLC certificate is here in California. It's California property. It's part of the California system. And you would say, no, the certificate of ownership is up in Wyoming. It's a certificated security. And you have to go to Wyoming to get a court order to get that. It's again, it's another roadblock. Right. Is it difficult to get this kind of court orders? Uh, do Wyoming courts uh, look favorably well, on you, you, 
we, we've uh, had this program for a number of years and we've never had a case on it. So it's, it's not something that the attorneys want to do because you have to hire an attorney in Wyoming to get a court order to get the certificate. Well, maybe there's a way to settle this thing and have to go through all of those gyrations. Mm -hmm. Another thing I was wondering about is you have the, the option to be a member managed uh, LLC or a, a manager managed LLC. And I always wondered how is that different? Well, it, it, LLCs are really flexible. And so the, the law in each state says you, someone has to manage it, right? Someone has to make it go. But the manager can be an outside person. You know, you hire a professional manager to come in and do it. They don't have to be an owner. Or they can be an owner, a member of the LLC who's going to do it. And so either one works. Either one allows for someone to manage the LLC. We like manager managed uh, because if you're going to start out member managed and someday bring in a manager, a professional manager to do the work, you have to amend the articles. You have to go back to the state and amend the articles. It's just easy to start out manager managed, right? And so you have the flexibility of having the members be owners. They can always be, I mean, managers or a non-owner be a manager. And so that's how we do it. But, you know, again, LLCs are extremely flexible. They're contracts really between the owners on how to run things and you can set it up, whatever works best for you. And when you would start it with the manager, manage them, you would have a nominal manager that maybe is a service that you could provide me to manage my company, or I would be both the owner and the manager, but I would kind of wear two hats. How, how yeah, I would work? rather see you save money. So I, you could be the manager <laughs> of your own LLC. I do have clients that will set up separate management companies to, you know, for various tax reasons to pay for medical benefits or whatever. But at the start, I think you just need one LLC to be on title to the property, maybe have the Wyoming LLC for the protection, but then you can manage both of those without having to have an extra management company. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so what about the resident agent? Uh, is it important? Uh, when, I, when I started in my first company, you know, I went to this uh, lawyer who incorporated for me and, um, and he became the resident agent. I didn't even know that he was going to be that and everything went through him. And eventually I got tired of chasing my mail and I took care of everything. And, and it's, it doesn't seem to be a lot of hassle to do that, but, but maybe I'm missing something. Well, there are a couple little uh, war stories to tell here, Steve. So <laughs> you can be your own registered agent, right? Um, so if you live in Virginia, you have a Virginia LLC, you can list yourself as the registered agent. There are a couple little issues though. Let's say you travel a lot, right? And you're not home to receive service of process. The, the registered agent is there to receive notice of a lawsuit. That's their main function. So instead of having someone suing you have to track you down all across the state of Virginia, they list one address on the website and the, the, the process server, the, the person bringing notice of the lawsuit can go to your home and serve you. But if you're not there, right, if you're traveling, then they can say to the court, look, we tried to serve Steve. He wasn't there. And the court says, okay, the next step is to publish notice in the newspaper of the lawsuit in the little tiny two point type in the back of the newspaper that you'll never see. So then they go back to court and say, we, we published notice in the newspaper, Steve didn't respond. And the judge says, okay, well, you tried everything. You get a default judgment, meaning mm -hmm. the other guy has just won the case. So, if you're traveling, we, we'd rather have you use a service that they're going to, pro we provide this service in all 50 states. Someone comes by, they deliver notice of a lawsuit. We're on the phone immediately to our clients, telling them about this, getting the paperwork to them, because you've only got 30 days in most states to answer a complaint. So you got to get on it if you've been sued. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, we like a professional service that is going to be there. um, Even if you're traveling, if you're not home that day or whatever. The second problem, Steve, is sometimes people will list their home address as the registered agent and people will go look up and see where they live, see if you live in a nice house. Um, It can encourage uh, litigation. We had a situation where a lady in Maryland used a Maryland LLC to own a mobile home home park in Missouri. Mm -hmm. And the mobile home park was filled with meth heads. And they went online and saw that this lady lived in a very nice house in Maryland. And they posted the picture of her house uh, on, at the, at the uh, mobile home meth park and said, look, this is where the owner lives. You don't have to pay rent. And so we just would rather not have your name and home address on the public record. So that's another avenue in which the, a, a third party registered agent can help you just gives you a little bit more privacy. Yeah, no, I I get that. That's definitely important. Um, So, uh, so tell me about the other service. What kind of other services do you guys provide other than being resident um, uh, registered agent, uh, structuring the asset protection, setting up uh, these LLCs and different corporations all over the place, maybe giving some tax advice. What are the kind of services uh, if I am a super wealthy person and I want kind of the whole enchilada of different services, what other stuff could I buy from you? Well, and you don't have to be super wealthy for these services. I mean, if, if you call our office and mention Rich Dad, it's $595 per entity. And then the state filing fees vary from state to state. But for example, Wyoming's only $100. So $695 um, to set up the entity. Then in the second year, it's only 125 for the registered agent fee. But the other service we provide, Steve, is it's really important that you maintain these entities. You've set it up, you're doing business through that entity or owning real estate. You have to maintain it or else you lose your protection. And so by maintaining it means you have a registered agent, you pay the fee to the state where you've set up the entity or where you're qualified to do business. And then it's important to have a meeting every year. So it's called the annual meeting. And most states require that once a year, you have a meeting where you appoint officers, you approve all the things that happen during the year. And we provide that service as well. So we will do your minutes uh, for your meeting for corporations or LLCs. So we wanna show the world that we've set up the entity, when you uh, print up checks or business cards, you're going to put LLC or Inc. on there. So people know that they're, they're dealing with a corporation or LLC, not Steve as an individual. <laughs> you'll have the corporate notice. You'll do an annual tax return for the entity in most cases. Uh, you'll do the annual minutes. You're following the formalities that the court expects to see. If you don't follow these formalities, and someone sues the corporation, let's say the corporation doesn't have any more money, they can come back to you and say, well, Steve didn't follow the formalities. Um, And so we want to pierce through his LLC and get it as personal assets. It's called piercing the veil. And by following the formalities, you keep the veil up, you you stay protected. Uh, By falling apart or, you know, falling down, letting the veil uh, go down, you're giving them a shot to your personal assets. So we don't want that. So formation is important, but just as equally as important is maintenance, maintaining this entity year after year. That's, that's really important. And I don't, I mean, I, I haven't thought about that. Obviously I, I learned about it uh, in business school that, you know, the veil and uh, how do you maintain uh, the, the distinctiveness of the, of your personal uh, individual and the legal entity and make sure that you're protected. And, but I haven't, haven't really thought about if I don't follow all the formalities, then it's really not an LLC, then the liability is all mine. Correct. Wow. And it's really interesting, Steve, in, in 50% of the cases, courts pierce the veil. 50% of the time, people wow. haven't followed the formalities, they haven't paid the fees, they haven't done things 
the proper way. And the courts say, you're not entitled to protection. And the, the piercing the veil means they go right through the corporation and go after your personal assets in 50% of the cases. So a lot of people are just not following the formalities like they should. Wow. So, uh, so if I'm a one person LLC, which I am right now, then do I have to have a meeting with myself every year uh, to maintain that this is uh, distinct from me? Would that I know. Be people say, help? do I have to have a meeting with myself? That's kind of weird. Uh, you should. Um, even though some states say, oh, the LLCs are informal, you don't have to have the meetings. If you get called into court, I want you to have that minute book showing that you have the meetings because the judges, it, it just helps certify that you're following the formalities. Um, there have been cases where, you know, the LLC statute says you don't have to have the meetings. And the judge says, I want to see the meeting minutes. So I think it's important on an annual basis just to do these meetings. Now, when you form with us, we give you a book that shows you how to do it. I mean, you can do your own minutes, uh, but for people, a lot of people, it's like going to the dentist, you know, they just, it'll never get done. So we offer a service mm -hmm. where we'll do it for you. Yeah, that's, that's very smart. So if someone wanted to uh, kind of get into uh, these topics, what is the number one book that you would recommend from your library? Which one? of your books would be kind of the entry level for corporate cor formation? Well, Start Your Own Corporation is, you know, about corporations. It also talks about LLCs, and this applies to business owners and real estate investors. And then if you're going to be investing in real estate, uh, Loopholes of Real Estate talks about uh, asset protection strategies for real estate, uh, you know, title issues, title is very important, insurance issues. So this is more uh, focused on real estate, but those are the two key books that your, your listeners probably would, would find benefit in. Mm -hmm. Do you, I mean, are these concepts widely used? Um, will you, do you have a sense of what would be the proportion of real estate entrepreneurs that they would be actively using these, these processes? Is it overwhelming or it's just... Uh, well, share of these people. They, they don't teach this in school, Steve. So, you know, people aren't going to pick this up uh, on their own. Uh, but, you know, if you go to real estate seminars, you, you uh, watch YouTubes, people realize now that you know, we're such a litigious society that you just have to have this protection. So, I don't know, I would say that at least 75% of the people mm -hmm. are using LLCs to hold their real estate properties. Um, I think that probably 50% of the people are using LLCs to own their brokerage accounts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like Charles Schwab, they know how to transfer your uh, stock account from your individual name into an LLC. It's not a taxable event. You're just changing how the, the stock is held. A lot of people with assets are using LLCs for, for brokerage accounts, certainly for real estate, for gold and silver, you can have a, a, an LLC hold your bullion. Um, so, you know, these are, these are fairly common strategies now. They weren't 30 years ago, but they are mm -hmm. now. What about the C-Corp, S-Corp dichotomy? Uh, I've heard different explanations, but I never really understood exactly how it's different uh, to uh, have a C-Corp where you basically write off your expenses and then you pay yourself a dividend or an S-Corp but I thought it's, it's pretty much the same. What, what is the difference there? Well, it's interesting to note that they're both corporations, right? So when you form the corporation at the state, you don't say, I'm, I, need, I want a C Corp or I want an S Corp. The, the state will only issue you paperwork for a corporation. Once the corporation is formed, then you get to decide how it's taxed. All right. And C and S, you'd think it would stand for something really cool, but it really stands for an IRS code section. Mm -hmm. So code section C says there's a double tax. You pay tax at the corporate level. When you make distributions to the shareholders, you pay tax again at your ordinary income rates. So, you know, you have um, double tax with the C Corp, a tax at the corporate level. And when you make distributions, a tax at the shareholder level. Now, you don't have to distribute the money to the shareholders. You could pay the C-Corp tax and leave the money in the corporation for growth. 
right? Mm -hmm. So C Corps have their place. The S Corp is subchapter S, it's the IRS tax code number or letter. That provides for flow through taxation. So there's no tax at the corporate level. It's like a partnership return. It flows through to the individual. So two taxes on the C side if you distribute, one tax on the S Corp side. And each have merit. I mean, the, the S Corp is really good for minimizing payroll taxes. The, the C Corp is good for building up cash so that you can grow the business. Um, and you'll talk with your lawyer and CPA to come up with what's best for you. Um, but just know if you're going to be an S Corp, you have to file a form uh, within 45 days after you form the corporation. So you have to, you'll automatically be taxed as a C Corp mm -hmm. unless you take steps to be taxed as an S Corp and you'll file a form 2553 for that. But again, they're both corporations. They yeah. both need a registered agent. They both need the minutes. They're both corporations. And then the S Corp, uh, whether you take this issue or not, you get taxed on your share of the profits? Correct. Okay. Correct. So that's a really great explanation. I never understood that this is the idea that the C Corp, you can accumulate uh, money uh, that you don't have to tax un un unless you take it. And for growth, that's great. Uh, what I also didn't understand is that, okay, the S Corp, there's no double taxation at the, the entity level, but uh, the double taxation is going to be at the individual level because when I uh, make my personal income tax and I didn't pay tax on those dividends, I'm going to have to pay it as income, right? So yeah, it's income. Yeah, yeah. you're going to you're not going to pay tax at the entity level, but everything that flows through is profit. You're going to pay tax on it. Yeah. But yeah. If, if, if I take a dividend, then my tax is going to be lower because I'm going to pay just the dividend tax, 20 percent of whatever it is. Right. So even though it got taxed at the corporation level, my tax will be less at the individual level, whereas in the S Corp, I have to pay full income tax. Or maybe, maybe I'm missing something there. Well, the S Corp, here's the, here's the thing with the S Corp is, um, you know, the IRS says someone's got to earn a salary here, right? I mean, this doesn't happen by itself. Um, with LLCs and passive real estate, you, you can get by without paying a salary. But in a business setting, mm -hmm. the IRS rightly says, look, someone has to make this go. And so we expect to see a salary somewhere. And so you're going to pay a salary first out of the S Corp and you're going to pay the darn payroll taxes on that, which if you're the owner and the employee, if you wear both hats, that's 15.3%. And yeah. so, you know, we don't want to pay a huge salary and pay 15.3% and ordinary income tax on top of that. So with the S Corp, you pay yourself a reasonable salary pay the 15.3% and then distribute the rest through so you don't have to pay all those payroll taxes. And again, working with a good CPA, you'll be able to do that. But with the S Corp taxation, you can save, you know, $5,000 a year easily by using the S Corp taxation and paying yourself a reasonable salary and then distributing the profits after that without payroll taxes. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Now I got it. Okay, awesome. So, uh, so Garrett, uh, that's great information. Um, what else uh, should I have asked uh, from the perspective of an entrepreneur that would be really interesting for an entrepreneur to learn that I have not? Well, uh, when we were uh, starting, we were talking about books and uh, you're, you've written a book, Steve, and I think it's the best business card there is. So for entrepreneurs that want to, you know, it's not for everybody, but you, if you want to establish yourself as an expert in your field, you know, having a book is a really great business card. So I think that's a strategy that, that some people uh, should consider. There's no barrier to entry now to getting a book out. I mean, you can get a book out very easily. Printing is not expensive. You can get it on Amazon pretty easily. So, uh, you know, that's a strategy for some entrepreneurs to think about. So when you have a book, because what I understand is there are 300,000 books being published every year. So there are a lot of people have this business card. How do you actually use that book uh, other than just having it? I mean, 
I actually already have two books on, on Amazon that no one is reading because they are not very good books and I haven't promoted them. Uh, the new one I think is a good one and I'm going to promote it. But, uh, you know, how, how do you use it as a business owner to, uh, to make it really work for you? Well, you can have a book and, uh, you know, you can also, you can charge for it, but you can give it away. I mean, I have clients that will write a book and, you know, have it edited and make sure it's, you know, worthy, uh, but they'll give it away to get someone's name, right? To get an email address. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a lot of people, the, the email address is really important. I mean, that allows you to market to them. We, we have a newsletter. We don't heavily market stuff because uh, that's just who we are. But plenty of people will give away the book and then use that uh, email address to solicit business. Um, and, and, you know, these are all strategies that a good marketing person would be able to tell you about. Yeah. No, that's a great, that's a great idea. Um, I have not thought about that recently, but that's, that's absolutely a, a good one uh, that I'm going to, to work on. Okay, well, uh, lots of good information and sounds like it's not that simple that everyone can do it in their garage. So if someone would like some help with their corporate formation maintenance, uh, fine tuning or the asset protection stuff, where should they turn to and how can they uh, reach your team or yourself? Well, two ways, Steve. The, our website is corporatedirect.com, corporatedirect.com. And we also offer a free 15-minute phone consultation with one of our incorporating specialists. So you can either uh, schedule that at corporatedirect.com or you can call 800-600-1760. And we'll be happy to get on the phone with you and explain our pricing and see if we can assist you. Um, so 800-600-1760. And, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you haven't done the minutes, or maybe you're worried that someone could try and pierce the veil, we can help you uh, clean up the corporation. We can get you a good registered agent that appreciates the job of a registered agent. We offer that service in all 50 states. But, you know, we, we help with the maintenance, the formation, and, and just make sure that you are adequately protected. Because again, we live in a very litigious society. People are suing each other all the time now. So we want to stay protected. That sounds uh, awesome and very useful. So Gareth Sutton, a best-selling uh, author of 11 books, 900,000 people uh, cannot all be wrong reading him. <laughs> Uh, so I recommend you check him out, uh, corporatedirect.com. Um, thanks for coming to the show, Garrett. And uh, for you, our listeners, uh, stay tuned until next week. This was the Prof Serve Traction Podcast with Steve Prada. To learn how your professional services or technology business could break through the ceiling with EOS, visit tractionequity.com.